Thanks for staying with us. Time now for African News with me, Georgia Calvin Smith. Tonight, the death toll from the Ugandan boat that went down over the weekend rises to above 100. The crowned vessel was carrying hundreds of Congolese refugees, making a desperate and fatal dash to return home. Also, Liberia now suspects it may be dealing with its own cases of the deadly Ebola virus. This after neighboring Guinea gets the all clear for Conakry, but struggles to contain an outbreak of fatalities in remote areas. And we'll be hearing the sounds of Sudan meeting one artist who's taking traditional music and instruments on the road in the hopes of keeping creative traditions alive. First up, at least 107 people were killed when their boat capsized on a lake in western Uganda over the weekend. The death toll continued to rise on Monday as rescue teams kept pulling victims from the water. Most of the passengers were Congolese refugees so desperate to return home that they crammed into a dangerously overloaded ferry. Alex Turnbull has more. Swollen bodies on the surface of Lake Albert. Rescue teams from Uganda recovered dozens this weekend after a ship capsized between Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo. On board, at least 250 passengers, according to the UN, mainly Congolese refugees on their way back to their home country. There was a group of refugees from Congo who have been staying in the refugee camp in Changwali, in Hoima district. They decided to organize on their own to see how they can go, go back. But unfortunately, along the way, they got an accident, their boat capsized. The ferry was not designed to carry more than 80 passengers, and at least one eyewitness claims the captain was drunk upon departure. 41 people were rescued from the lake and taken in by the UN's refugee agency. Relatives from neighboring DRC have arrived at the site to try and identify the victims. Dozens are still reported missing. Despite recent efforts by local authorities and NGOs to improve safety standards, many boat owners in the area continue to overload their vessels. Now, thousands of Congolese had fled to neighboring countries to escape militia like the ADF Nalu, who terrorized the east of the country for almost a decade. This year, the Congolese government focused more resources on a crackdown on the armed gangs, prompting some refugees to think it was safe to go home. Leah Lisa Westerhaus tells us more from Goma. Indeed, according to the UNHCR, who was actually taking care of the camp where they stayed, many of these Congolese refugees received calls from their families over the past days saying it was safe to go back home. You have to imagine uh, that many of these Congolese actually live quite close to the Ugandan border. And because of the repeated presence of rebel groups in that region, they're actually quite used to cross the border to Uganda as soon as it gets dangerous and then go back to DRC when the security situation improves. Here again, most of the refugees had actually arrived quite recently in Uganda, mainly in July, fleeing the repeated attacks of the ADF Nalu a rebellion that is active in this northeastern part of DRC, a rebellion that has actually been quite strongly attacked by the Congolese army since mid-January. Um, some villages previously occupied by, by the rebels have been freed. So this is the reason why many Congolese refugees had decided to go back home over the weekend. It was supposed to be a four hour boat trip. It turned very sadly and as you know, into a nightmare for most of them. A recent spread of the Ebola virus has not yet officially hit Guinea's capital, say medics from the World Health Organization. Tests on suspected cases of the deadly illness came back negative Monday, but the threat is still there. The outbreak in Guinea is its first and has killed at least 59 people in the country's southern forests. Neighboring Liberia on Monday reported its first suspected victims. Six have been identified, of whom five have already died. Meanwhile, in Guinea, health workers are racing to contain the threat. This is the city of Gekdu in the Guinean forest, where the first case of Ebola fever was discovered back in February. Since then, the epidemic has killed at least 59 people. Members of the family of Bernard Tigiano were among the victims. He lost eight people close to him, including his pregnant wife. I have no family anymore now. No. My wife. Eight people died. It's finished now. 
Many people have been quarantined while a center to house sick people is being completed. This is one way of dealing with the virus that provokes contagious fevers, vomiting, diarrhea, and is deadly in most cases. In Gekdu and surrounding towns, humanitarian aid workers have been overwhelmed. Here we don't have supplies for protection. We are short of workers and supplies. The Guinean government is on high alert. It has sent emergency protection kits in a partnership with the Doctors Without Borders NGO and is trying to keep people informed. We are establishing surveillance perimeters around the areas. We are explaining to local people what health and nutrition measures they must take. This concerns food, animals and clothing so that the virus can be contained. For the moment, at least, the Ebola fever has not hit Conakry. Liberia, Sierra Leone and Senegal have launched surveillance measures. An Egyptian court sentenced 529 supporters of deposed Islamist President Mohamed Morsi to death after just two hearings. It's a shock verdict that could still be overturned on appeal. Egypt's come down hard on Morsi's Muslim Brotherhood since his ousting last year. The defendants are part of a group or more of more than 1,200 alleged Islamists accused of killing two policemen and rioting last August. There's been a mixed reaction to the judgment amongst Egyptians. Some are suspicious of the speed of the decision when Morsi's toppled predecessor, Hosni Mubarak, remains under house arrest. So why hasn't Mubarak been given the death penalty? Why hasn't Habib al-Adli been given the death penalty? So why haven't any of the ministers in jail been given the death penalty so far? Is their lawyer just really good and the lawyer for the 500 Muslim Brotherhood defendants lousy? Or are the judges just different, each working according to different laws? This is a farce. This is good because it is the first time we see our judges act so quickly, because this was the second session. So the best thing about it is that it happened quickly from the time of the clearing out of the Rabba and Nadar squares. But this is something new for us when you have a big case decided so quickly. So we're very happy about this. The judge in Oscar Pistorius's murder trial today heard police evidence suggesting that the Olympian's late girlfriend was at times scared of him. The trial against the South African track stars entered its fourth week and forensic experts on Monday read out text messages sent by Reva Steenkamp in the weeks before Pistorius shot her dead last Valentine's Day. Well, our Aisha Ishmael has the latest. She joins us now from Cape Town. Aisha, so today we had a bit more of an insight into the couple's sometimes turbulent relationship. Well, today was day 14 of the Oscar Pistorius trial, and Oscar and Reva's sometimes rocky and even explosive relationship was laid bare in court today, with cell phone messages exchanged between the two of them being read out in open court. Now, these messages revealed quite a jealous and possessive Oscar Pistorius. Um, Reva revealed in one of the messages that she was scared of Oscar, and in another, she said he made her sad, but also that she was in love with him and that he was an amazing person. Now, cell phone um, analyst Captain Francois Muller told court today that of the more than 1,000 messages between Oscar Pistorius and Reva Steenkamp, 90% were normal and loving conversations. And while these messages were being read out in court, Oscar became quite emotional and cried in court as these very personal and intimate messages between him and Reva were being read out publicly. Now, I don't think that anybody would want that to happen to them. You wouldn't want your um, messages between between your partner, your, your girlfriend or boyfriend, to be laid bare um, in, in a manner in which it was done today. So Aisha, some of this sounds quite explosive when taken just by itself, but this could still all be said to be within the bounds of a normal relationship. Well, that is exactly what this police officer analyst said. He said that of the more than 1,000 messages between Oscar and Reva, 90% of these messages, and, um, and I'm quoting him now, he said, were normal and loving conversations. But of course, the trial continues, and it's all going to continue for quite a bit, and we'll see, we'll have to wait and see what comes out of the cross-examination in days to come. Now, the prosecution's really been pushing hard in trying to present Pistorius as being uh, a, a man who had a, a love of guns, who is possibly uh, quite volatile. Uh, 
we've entered the fourth week of the trial so far. Has one side or the other managed to push its case better than the other? It's very difficult to say at this stage. Um, it, it, it's really, it's really not as clear cut as people thought it would be. Um, we know from the very beginning that Oscar Pistorius um, admitted that he did shoot Reva, but he said he shot her in self-defense. He thought that there was an intruder in the bathroom, and he shot her in self-defense. Whereas the state is saying it was premeditated murder. Thanks very much, Aisha Ishmael there for us from Cape Town. And finally, we head to some sounds of Sudan. We're meeting one artist who's taking traditional music and instruments on the road in the hopes of keeping creative traditions alive. The Fal El Hajj is working on reintroducing old scores for a new audience. Only the elders know of this ritual. For years, Defala El Hajj has come here to the banks of the Nile to find inspiration. His assistant is preparing the dingir, an instrument made of carved out pumpkins filled with water. I can play all the instruments I have, but I'm only very good with 23 of them. I managed this by spending a lot of time with the communities who play them in their villages. El Hajj is a musician. He sings in 15 different dialects, but also makes instruments. All he needs are a sheet of skin, half a dried pumpkin, and a few strings. I have quite a collection, about 52 traditional and popular instruments. They're on display at my workshop, but I also make them on request. In most cases, those who play traditional musical instruments also make them, but with the fast pace of life today, many musicians want the instruments ready to use. El Hajj founded this cultural center dedicated to traditional Sudanese music. Here, he teaches children how to use these instruments, including the traditional umkiki bow. Free lessons, he says, are the best way to preserve the country's musical heritage. Here at Sudan University, we teach music, but unfortunately we don't teach traditional or even modern Sudanese music, because the syllabus is very European. El Hajj has also, for the last 17 years, taken his skills on the road, touring with a band of 40 musicians and dancers throughout the country in the hopes of keeping Sudan's creative traditions alive. Well, that's it for me, Marco. And up next with all the world headlines. Stay with us. Beyond business. If you build it, will they come? Bilbao in northern Spain constructed a Guggenheim museum and saw millions of visitors pour into the city. In Beyond Business, we look at how cities around the world are trying to emulate its success. Beyond Business, en France 24, en France24.com.